Let's just pray. Let's let his spirit just continue. We thank you, Lord, for the, the peace which you bring. We thank you, Lord, that, uh, that we can just rest and, and take a breath. Uh, and as we sing, Lord, it's, it's like you're the, you're the breath in our lungs. And so fill us, continue to fill us with just your presence. And we just thank you. We thank you that we're able just to uh, come together in, in that peace in your presence. We pray that you continue to be with us in Jesus' name. Amen. For the last, uh, I guess since April, uh, I haven't spoken that many times, I guess, to the local fellowship, but uh, I have done the same message how many times now? Uh, I have stopped us. I have caused us to interact, uh, to pray for each other. Uh, so you'll be glad to know that this morning I'm going on and in Peter, First Peter, but I'm going on. But I am going to just remind us of some of those points again. First, we've talked about that there was a foredetermined and resolute plan uh, where the will of God would be executed. Um, we've talked about that. We've talked about as believers, we have been chosen to rule and reign with Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. But we're not going to be ruling the way we have lived. No, no. Uh, we are not who we were. It was another point that we made. We are... Uh, we've been born again to a new way of life, born anew. Isn't that great? We've been born to holiness. Amen? Amen. Amen. Good. I'm just going through this very quickly. Uh, and when we've encountered Jesus Christ, and this is all the lessons we've been learning from Peter, when we've encountered Jesus Christ we, uh, and become born again, we were catapulted into a power engagement with the Holy Spirit. Amen? Sounds like we're really vibrant and alive with that this morning, aren't we? Now, we're, we're trying to take a breath here, but we've been born again to a power engagement Amen. with the Holy Spirit. He, he comes in, He changes. Uh, that's what Susan was reading this morning. When God's presence comes, I mean, you know, He, he turns uh, everything around in us. Isn't that wonderful? Uh, so He has uh, really catapulted us into a place of faith. Um, we also learned that uh, Jesus uh, bore our sin in his body. And I'm not going to go through all what that meant. But this much I know. We are healed because of his stripes. They were shown to us and we were able to see them so that when the time came when we needed to know that healing was ours, we could reach out and believe and trust what he did on the cross. Hallelujah. By his stripes, you were healed. And we prayed that. Now, do you believe it? Sure you do. Okay. So because of that, we also talked about one of the points in Peter was that every sound, every sound believer has a reason to rejoice. Is that right? So why don't you just rejoice right now? Why don't you just rejoice? What's your reason for rejoicing? Come on, there you go. what is your reason for rejoicing? Just, just say it. Lord, I, I, because Lord, you've given us life. Lord, you have given us uh, breath. You, you have given us hope. All right, very good, very good. So, in being able to rejoice, we also sing in Peter that faith illumines the believer. Faith illumines the believer. Uh, what that means is that we shine when we exercise that faith that we have in Him. It is a light. It's a light that this world needs. Everybody say amen to that? Amen. amen. Okay. Boy, we're really just flying. I'm, I'm just fly Look at this. I'm just flying through these notes this morning. All right. And finally, at least uh, uh, not all the points but uh, that I want to share this morning, is that we were born again, but what were we born again to? A living hope. There you go. All right. So we are excited and, and we are alive. It is a vital thing that we've been born again to, and that's hope. Now, again, uh, if you've missed any of those sermons over the last, uh, I mean, I've gave the same sermon for uh, half a dozen times. If you missed it, sorry. We're moving on. You can get the recording. Yes. 
And, uh, you know, again, you can listen to them on tape or whatever. So let's turn to 1 Peter 3. 1 Peter 3. This is where, we, this is where I've stopped. We're, we're through 1, 1 Peter 3 and verse 8. And Amy, I don't know if you have that, but uh, I didn't even tell you to do this, but maybe you can flash that up. I want to get somebody to read uh, 1 Peter uh, 3, 8 through 15. Is that going to come up there? And you can read it if we don't have uh, God's friends. All right. Who wants to read that? Out loud. Somebody. Anyone. Volunteer. Quickly. All right. Go ahead, Seth. Read this off up here, Seth. Read it, read it in this translation up here. Can you do that? Sum up all of you, be harmonious, sympathetic, brotherly, kind-hearted, and humble in spirit. Not returning evil for evil or insult for insult, but giving a blessing instead. For you were called to the very, for the very purpose that you might inherit a blessing. For the one who deserves life to love and see good days must keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. He must turn away from evil and do good. He must seek Sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts, always being ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you, yet with gentleness and reverence. Okay, thank you. All right, appreciate that. All right. So, here we are in Peter. So after Peter exhorts us on how we should behave as subjects of the state, uh, how we should behave even as slaves to masters, and we talked about all this, remember? Uh, as wives and as husbands, uh, all using Jesus as our example, he teaches us how we should treat one another. And this is where he goes. After all the good things we've heard and all the power, uh, this power engagement with the Holy Spirit, then Peter goes into teaching us how we should treat one another. And he says, first, be harmonious. And be of one mind in the way we should live as a Christian. Be harmonious and be of one mind in the way we should live in the Christian. You know, uh, th th Paul said the same thing. Paul, in Romans uh, 15, 5, Paul says this. He's, uh, 15, 5 and 6. He says, Now may the God who gives you perseverance and encouragement grant you to be of the same mind with one another according to Christ Jesus, so that with one accord you may be with one voice, May we with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay? It's, it's basically saying the same thing. Be harmonious. So, what does living harmoniously mean? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Whoa. Well, I tell you what. If it does mean that we have to agree on everything, then we as husbands and wives are really going to have a hard time. Be one to be of one mind. What does that mean? <laughs> have the, okay, we can have. Uh, are you, these are great words, aren't they? Scripture. What does it mean? Live harmoniously. Uh, uh, All right. Okay. Very good, Jim. They're good. That's, a, uh, that's, a, that's, that's exactly right. Yeah. Hey, yeah, Dan? Hey, well, all right. Very good. Now, now, now we're starting to get with the harmony. It doesn't necessarily mean agreement. Uh, yeah, or, but, but I do think it means having compassion for one another. Uh, you know, that we are together in this walk. Uh, you know, we, again, we, we read through these scriptures, and we read through them very fast, but I mean, the, he's saying, be harmonious. Be of one mind. Uh, we don't, we're not supposed to hate each other. Persecute each other. Is there enough persecution going on outside the church? Is there? Come on. Is there enough going on in this world that we do not need to do that to each other? 
Unless we, of course, want to bring the world into the church, which is what Jay used to say all the time, that the devil has joined the church. You know, because no, he knows that's where he can really get to us. All right. But to be symp- uh, sympathetic, uh, kind to one another. Uh, you know, I, I, I agree with this. I concur with the fear, unless they pull out in front of me in traffic. I mean, uh, I, sometimes I, I, I'm, I'm really, in my, in my own self, if, we're, if I'm driving in town, I'm wondering if it's you that just pulled out in front of me because I don't give you a good look. And I just left you. And he says to be kind-hearted. What does it mean to be kind-hearted to someone? What does it mean? Anybody? Compassionate. Compassionate? What does that mean? I mean, let's put it in practical terms. What does it mean to be kind-hearted to someone? Caring? Feel, feel for them. Maybe I'm getting a little bit more. Affirm? Woo. Golden rule. What'd you say? Affirming? Affirming them. Uh, they exist. Uh, they're God. Excuse me? Encour- encouraging. All right. Very good. All right. Benefit of the doubt. Yeah, then, then Peter says, go on and be humble in spirit. Be humble in spirit. Oh, the, you know, this, this is... Uh, this is really hitting at the core of things, isn't it? Uh, when Peter is speaking, I, I you, you know, you, do you know what I, I wrote this down uh, last night. Last night, uh, I came down and, and you know, and, and just sitting with the Lord, and I said, "Do you know what you know? What I think produces humility." I wrote this down: finding out what you are really like while you're telling someone else what they are like. That produces humility. Doesn't me. I mean, you know, you, we always see it in someone else, right? But when we're telling them, all of a sudden we realize what we are really like. And when that revelation comes, oh my gosh. I really believe this is God's call for marriage. is to keep each other humble. <laughs> and in humility. Humility is, is approaching that someone is not... Uh, uh, you're not better than someone else, no matter what you think. No matter what you think, you really are not. As a matter of fact, it's usually the other way around. And I have the scripture to back that up, by the way. But I'm not going to read that this morning. But you know, Peter is saying how we ought to treat. Now, this is after he gives us all this. We are called of God. We are chosen. We are, you know, and he's talking to persecuted Christians. And he's, and, he's, and, he's, he's lying, and he's saying these things. You need to rejoice and all these things. But then, but, you know, I, I think he tells us how we need to live with each other. But there's a balance. There's a balance here. And I, and I want to share this balance with you. I, I think uh, Paul, Paul addresses how, how to handle someone who is just a flagrant sinner. You know, that comes into the picture too. What does Paul say? He says, and, uh, I wrote to you not to associate with anyone's so-called brother if he so-called brother, if he is an immoral person or covetous or an idolater or a reviler, which means someone who insults constantly, which he says, let's don't give insult to insult, or a drunkard or a swindler, not even to eat with such a one. That's what Paul says. Now, he comes back later on and he says, you know, you, you, you need to watch your attitude in that balance in this thing and walking out and how to find this but but no, but knowing that each of us would be evil treated in this world or even hated because of Jesus Christ Peter instructs us not to render evil for evil you see he's he, he's he's talking to people who have been persecuted who've been treated evilly here believers have any of you had that experience you know we were an article uh, a long time ago about how uh, Christians wound. We, we wound our own soldiers. Well, uh, but we're not supposed to trade insult for insult. I mean, it, the, it, Peter goes on to say the, there's, there's law enforcers. They are to, it's designed, the law is designed to punish evildoers. And the court system is designed to seek a, a legal, legal remedy, supposedly, 
when someone is wronged. And we know how that works. But private revenge is forbidden. Did you know that in Scripture? Uh, so, so these, these scriptures, let me just read this. I think they concur with what Peter is saying here. Romans, Paul said this in Romans 12, 7. Never pay back evil for evil to anyone. Respect what is right in the sight of all men. He also says in Thessalonians, See that no one repays another with evil for evil, but always seek after that which is good for one another and for all people. This is living harmoniously. These are the things that, that we're really talking about. Now, Let's listen to what Jesus says. You ready for this? Are you ready? These are the words of Jesus. If you don't listen to any words I say this morning, listen to the words of Jesus. But I say to you who hear, love your enemies. Some of, some of you right now just probably need to get on your knees and repent. Because that is not happening. Love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. I often picture Jesus when he's doing this. It's, he's so kind as he's saying it. Love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Do, do you know that if he sat in here right now, and he said that in regard to this political election, do you know what I would, what I would do after I w get up and walk out? <laughs> 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 Oh, Lord, don't stir it up. See, it just stirs it up. Bless those. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. Whoever hits you on the cheek, offer him the other cheek also. And for whoever who takes away your coat and does you wrong, do not withhold your shirt from him either. Give to everyone who asks of you, and whoever takes away what is yours, do not demand it back. Treat others, here's the golden rule, Beth, treat others the same way you want them to treat you. Everybody take a breath. It's time for us to just take a breath, isn't it? It's time to take a breath. Now, let's get this straight. Let me, let me let's figure this out. When someone insults you or does evil to you, what are you supposed to do? You're supposed to give them a blessing. Don't associate with them, but give them a blessing. Didn't Paul say not to associate with them? But give them a blessing. Where are we going to go with this? Uh, I think that this can only be understood in the context of what Jesus has done for us. The only way I can understand uh, the balance in Scripture is to see what He's done in my personal life. That's the only way I can understand this. Uh, it's, it's, you know, uh, am I worthy to receive the glory? No. So I am unworthy? Are you worthy to receive the glory? So you are unworthy. So you, being unworthy, have received the inheritance of the blessing, Peter said. You are unworthy. Are those who mistreat us unworthy? They sure are. Are you unworthy? You sure are. But you have received an inheritance of blessing, Peter said. We were deemed evil so that we would be redeemed good. We were deemed evil, but we have been redeemed good. Wow. Wow. Then Peter quotes the psalmist, Psalm 34. He says, the one who desires life, listen. The one who desires life to love and see good days must keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. 
He must turn away from evil and do good. He must seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are toward the righteous and his ears attend to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. There's three points here. Three points Peter is making. First, if you want and desire life, and for it to be good to you, what must happen? There's four points here. One is this. You've got to what? Keep your tongue from doing what? Speaking evil. Hello. Now, this gets very practical. This gets very practical. Go ahead and bite it. Everybody just bite your... Just do that for a moment. Just bite it. That's what you're going to have to do. If you want to have a good life. I, I, I'm hearing people all the time. Why has this happened to me? What, what's going on? And, 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 the, and the element that, that's not illumining. It's a, where their faith is not interacting very well with what's going on and what God is doing. What do they do? About somebody who is uh, the mistrust or somebody they hurt. What, what do they do? What do they do? What do you do? What do you do? What do I do? Let's make it personal. <sighs> Go ahead. Go ahead and just chew on it. Chew on it a little bit. Then he says, keep, our, keep your lips from speaking untruths. What, what's an untruth? What's a practical untruth that you speak? Anyway, come on, I'm, I'm asking you. What's a, what's a practical untruth you speak on a daily basis? Always. Say what? Always. Okay. No, uh, you always, always, never. Uh, in a very practical way, how, how, how does it, how does it, uh, how does that expose itself? Uh, let, let's talk about uh, uh, healing. What's a, what's a way where you speak deceit? I'm sick. I don't, I don't feel well. Now, is that the truth? It's the truth. But what is the truth? Yeah, it's a fact, Sally. It's, exact, it's more of a fact, and it's a factual truth. However, I'm not trying to go too far here. But the fact is, is that I'm not feeling well. But in Jesus, I am healed. And I'm going to believe that. That's the truth. That's the truth. You see, our lips can speak deceit. There's life and death in the tongue. And in the lips, even as Peter say. Because when you speak deceit, what are you speaking? Out of the inward parts comes your treasure. You're speaking curse rather than life. Uh, the second part... Uh, the requirements uh, to have a good life. Do good and not do evil. These are just basic premises of a Christian life. Do good and do not do evil. Let's put that in practical terms. What does that mean on a day-to-day basis? <laughs> Actually, that's probably, that's probably as, about as practical as you can get. Do the dishes and don't leave them for somebody else to do. Very practical. <laughs> Second part of that is seek peace and pursue it. What is, what is peace that we are to seek? You, you tell me. It's so right, and you are producing a good life. Everybody knows Burkett. He's not here this morning. I mean, what, what do you? I mean, I've 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 been around Burkett where he's gotten very real. But you know what? The consistent thing is that he he's always speaking what life life. So you're going, oh man. So it produces a good life, good results. That's all Peter is saying here. He's saying, uh, I'm going to get ahead of myself. Uh, number three, the third point. Let me just go, let me go. The eyes 
of the Lord are towards the righteous. Another translation says, the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous. They're looking over you. I mean, they see you. I mean, uh, what that means is that God takes special notice of the righteous. Uh, he exercises a, a providential governance over those who are righteous. He, he respects them. Get this picture. I mean, God respects you when you live a righteous life. What does that mean? Tim, it's one of your favorite words, respect. I mean, what does that mean when God respects you in your life because you're living righteous? Um, I'm, in, in my mind, I'm thinking of uh, a group of children playing, and I'm thinking about the, the one that's yours. You, you, you catch, they're, they're catching your eye all the time. There are 30 other kids out there, and you can see that mm. one little toe. Good. It's, it's, it's Good example. Stuff. That's a good example. That's a good example. Wow, that's a father's heart there. Uh, his ears are attuned. They're open to their prayers. And if they are attacked by the enemy, if the righteous are attacked by the enemy, he will be attuned to those distresses and he will deal with our enemies. He will deal with your enemies if you're living a righteous life. Why? Because his face is against those who do evil. He will pursue them, and you can be certain he is more an enemy to the wicked than we could ever be. Did you know that? God is an enemy to the wicked? Now, whose side do you want to be on here? Who, who do you think can handle the situations and the attacks we're going under in our lives personally as, an, as, as a nation? Who do you think? Who, who, do you want to put this, who do you want to put your hands into? Our, our next presidential uh, candidate or God himself? He will... Pursue our enemies. Come on. It's, come on. The truth. Let's speak. God will pursue my enemies. God will pursue them. He'll track them down. I mean, he will track them down. He will destroy my enemies. He will destroy them. What is the message of Peter, y'all? That as a loving father, number one, God has a special affection. Tim, is what you're saying, a parental care. For each of his righteous children. And number two, God always hears the prayers of the faithful, of the righteous. Isn't this so simple? You say, I know that. But do you? Are you living that way? The writer of Hebrews says, Therefore, let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace so that we may receive mercy and find grace in our time of need. John says, This is the confidence that we have before him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the request which we have asked from him. Whatever we ask, whatever you ask. Well, who in this group believes that anymore? Do you believe that? That whatever you ask, that's the reason. We don't believe. The reason many of us struggled with answered prayer is because we have not understood fully the conditions. Amen. 
Peter is speaking here of us living a righteous life. He knows we're being persecuted. He knows we're going through these things. He knows all this, but he's saying, listen, in the midst, you need to be harmonious. You need to be kind. You need to, you, you need to be encouraging each other. You need, you need to be living a life that's holy. And then he goes on and quotes Psalm 34 and it says, you know, if you want to have a good life. <laughs> I mean, they, they've been run out of their country. They have no country of their own. They, they're being persecuted. Some of them are slaves. And he said, if you want to have a good life, you've got to have a good attitude. It sounds like the end. You see, the key to understanding all this, is locked up, I think, in the vault of eternal wisdom. Suffering is not the will of God. But if we suffer for the sake of righteousness, we will be blessed. This is what Peter is talking about. I want you to listen to the words of Jesus one more time. This is in Matthew 5. You'll you'll recognize this. Blessed are those who have been persecuted for the sake of righteousness. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Here it comes. I think Peter just made this up himself. Rejoice. And be glad, for your reward in heaven is great. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. You are the salt of the earth. But if the salt has become tasteless, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under the feet of man. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor does anyone light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on the lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Jesus knew That there was going to be persecution. I mean hello. He was persecuted. To suffer. For the cause of truth. To suffer. For a good conscience. Is the honorable duty of every Christian. Peter said. The delight of it. Is greater than the torment of it. The honor of it is greater than the disgrace of it. The gain is much more than the loss. Our enemies are God's enemies. His face is against them. His power is above them. And they are the object of His curse. And they can do nothing to you but by His permission. Do you hear that? The enemies can do nothing to you unless God allows it. So we are not to trouble ourselves about them. Instead of us living in terror in this day and time, With the fear of men. Peter says these words. We are to sanctify Christ as Lord in our heart. Catch this. Catch it if you will. What are we afraid of? What are we to be afraid of? Peter addresses this. No, you're not to be afraid and concerned of those things. You are to sanctify Christ in your heart. I believe we sanctify the Lord in our hearts 
when we with sincerity and fervency adore Him. When our thoughts center on His awesomeness. When we rely upon His power and give our trust to His faithfulness. When we submit to His wisdom, imitate His holiness, and encourage others to do likewise. I believe we understand what it means to sanctify Christ in our heart. When someone else asks us why we are hopeful. Remember, we're born again to a living hope. And we are to pulsate with the vitality of Jesus Christ dwelling within us. Who defeats the enemy about us and who eternally blesses us. That's it. That's it. What Peter is addressing in people of that time and of our time. It's a message that that I believe pulsates today. What are you afraid of? What are we having to go through? What are we having to face? And I say, as Peter, we need to sanctify Jesus in our hearts and adore him for who he is and what he has to offer. That's how we face. You want to have a good life? You want things to turn out okay? Watch what you're saying. Do not speak untruth. Seek peace. Do good and not evil. Wait the light. Come on, stand up. Stand up this morning. Just stand up. Reach your hands out towards heaven. And let's let's just, in, in some way... Oh, God, you are, we adore you. We adore you. That you would take us unworthy, unworthy sinners, if you would, and bless us with an eternal blessing. Bestow upon us and give us an inheritance that allows us to even sit beside you in high places, to rule and to reign, and to watch you destroy our enemies. And to bring those things which we need into our life. Which makes our lives good. So that we may offer and give them to other people. Where they can see the glory of God. Not only. Not only in the words. Not only in singing songs. But in our lives. Lord. How awesome are you? I adore you this morning Lord. I. I think all of you need to just personalize it and just say to him. Lord, I want you to I want you to have sanctity in my heart. I want you to fill it up with your presence towards any person I meet, towards anything I have to do, and towards any circumstance I have to face. I do not, Lord, want to tr- drudge through this life without the surety of your presence. That I may know that when I cry out to you, you will hear my prayer. And you will do what we have asked. I can't believe that. And that is an evil thing to say. I believe your word and I believe your truth. Oh God. You do not have to prove yourselves to us. But may we understand your love and presence in a new and powerful way that we may live righteously before you. In Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. 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 Everyone, learn to live. Learn to live. Uh, Casey came to me uh, earlier this summer uh, with the young people we had here. And and, and he said, do you know what the problem is? They don't know how to enjoy life. They just don't know how to enjoy life. And all of a sudden, they were coming alive. And God visited us. And all of a sudden, something started happening. But this much I know. Enjoy this week. Enjoy it. Whatever the circumstances, enjoy it. And find yourself in a place where Christ in you is being sanctified. Amen? Amen. Amen. You'll have a good week. I promise you. (laughs) Bless the Lord. Bless the Lord.